Hello everyone, welcome to the daily editorial analysis brought to you by Shankar IS Academy today 8th November 2024. Displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss. The first article, All Eyes on Baku and the Climate Finance Goal. This article is taken from the newspaper The Hindu. This article is talking about the new collective quantified goal. It is a new climate finance which is set to replace the, uh, the present $100 billion commitment by the developed nations. And that will be discussed and its positive side, its negatives and its challenges will be discussed in this topic. And the next uh, article is India, Pakistan and modifying the Indus Water Treaty. So, this article is taken from the newspaper Hindu and in this article we will be talking about the importance of Indus Water Treaty, its provisions and the, the present challenges. And the last article affecting mental health. This article is talking about the Australian government's plan to ban social media for children under age 16 without parental concern. This article is taken from the newspaper Indian Express and in this topic we will be discussing the impact of social media platform in the human life and how it is affecting the quality of life and what are the provisions that we have in India to ensure the cyber security and rights of children. Before moving into today's newspaper discussion, we have an important announcement from Shankar IAS Academy. We know that the prelims are getting tougher every year. So, solving as much as questions is the only way to crack the prelims. So, for that, the Shankar IAS Academy has launched a pre-storming UPSC prelims test series 2025 and two batches has already started and the third batch will be starting on 21st November 2024. The link for the registration will be given in the description. Do register, attend test and crack the prelims. With this, we will move to our today's newspaper discussion. Look at this newspaper article taken from Hindu, All Eyes on Baku and the Climate Finance Board. This article is talking about the upcoming COP29 that is Conference of Party 29 which is going to be held in Azerbaijan's capital Baku from 11th November to 22nd November. And But today this article is talking about a new concept which is going to be a matter of discussion in the COP29 that is the new collective quantified goal. So it is the world nations are believing that this new collective quantified goal it is a climate finance target which, which will bring an equitable and balanced approach in climate action. So let us discuss more about the new collective quantified goal in this background. And before that, we have a main question here. The question is, evaluate the effectiveness of this new collective quantified goal in bridging trust deficit between developed and developing countries. What ways can a balanced and fair in uh, new collective quantified goal contribute to equitable climate action? So this entire question can be divided into two parts. In the first part, we have to address uh, how this N NCQG, that is a new collective quantified goal, will bridge a trust deficit between developed and developing nations in the matter of climate change. We know that the two nations, two groups have different opinions regarding the source of fund, the implementation and uh, also uh, sharing responsibilities. So how this NCQG will bridge that trusted deficit between these two groups. And the second uh, part we have to address in what ways can a balanced and fair NCQG contribute to equitable climate action. That is this uh, here we have to give our own suggestion that how we can enhance the new collective quantified goal. To answer this question, we have to understand what is new collective quantified goal, its positive and, and its negative. So, let's begin the discussion. So, first we will we'll start with the basic question, what is new, col new collective quantified goal? It is a new climate finance target which is currently under the negotiation and it is expected to replace the 100 billion annual commitment by the developed nation. So, we know that as per the Paris Agreement, the developed nations are expected to, uh, you know, give 100 billion annually to fight the climate change and this new collective goal is is an updated version of this which is very important for the developing and underdeveloped nations in supporting climate adaptation mitigation and resilience building now we are going to see the positives of new collective quantified goal the first major positive is the enhanced climate finance that we know that the climate finance under the new collective quantified goal is aiming beyond 100 billion dollar uh, at, at present it is 100 billion dollar but this new collective quantified goal is aiming beyond the 100 billion dollar which is very important for the developing and underdeveloped nations to take steps against the climate change and second is the balanced uh, adaptation and mitigation measure that is the new collective quantified goal will ensure a balance between both adaptation and mitigation which is very important for vulnerable nations especially island nations uh, in the fight against the climate change and the third we have the predictable funding framework that is the new collective goal that is the new collective quantified goal proposes a clear time bound target which uh, which is expected to be between 5 years or 10 years which will make them a reliable source of funding and the next positive side of the new commitment quantified goal is focus on public and grant based finance so this will be very useful for the developing and underdeveloped nations 
because it will reduce the dependence on loan taken from multilateral forums and other developed nations to take steps against climate change. So this will be very useful for the developing and underdeveloped nations. And, and the next positive side is the accountability for developed nations. That is, that is the new quantified goal will reinforce will reinforce accountability under Paris Agreement, where it highlights the importance, where it highlights the responsibility of the developed nations to provide finance for underdeveloped and developing nations to fight the climate change. And the next important or the benefit is the boost multilateral collaboration. That is international cooperation among the nations to fly, uh, fight the climate change. In the morning itself, we, we discussed that the uh, country Brazil made a significant progress in the fight against the illegal deforestation in Amazon and uh, they brought the illegal deforestation in Amazon to 30%, a reduction of 30% engaged with the other nations such as Norway and uh, Germany for funding and uh, infrastructure support. So this new collective quantified goal will also boost the multilateral collaboration among the nations to fight the climate change. Now we are going to see the certain negative aspects of the new collective quantified goal. First major negative is the unresolved funding structure, that is disagreements on sources and contributors. The developed nations are pushing you know, uh, investments from, that is the developed nations are advocating for funding from private contributors and private financing, while the developed and underdeveloping countries are standing for grant based source and the next uh, negative aspect is the potential shift of burden to developing countries that is some developed nations push contributions from high income developing countries so this will you know the the shift the responsibility of the developed nations to developing nations and the developed nations are known as historical emitters so this will this is the next uh, negative aspect of the national the new collective quantified goal and the next uh, negative is the insufficient focus on adaptation. That is the current financial system, the current fin uh, climate financing system is leaning more towards mitigation rather than adaptation. Uh, on the other side, the, the positive side of the new collective quantified goal is the balance between, ensuring a balance between the, uh, the adaptation and the mitigation. And the next uh, negative is the reliance on private investments. So this, this has a potential to dilute the accountability. That is, if private investments will come in, the, the private investors will look profit over you know responsibility therefore it it it, it has a potential to dilute the accountability of steps taken against the climate change and the next major negative is the procedural and uh, access challenges that is hurdles for developing countries to access funds and the next negative is the risk of trusted deficit this is another major challenge too because of the past unmet pledges and ongoing de debts regarding uh, source of fund, a structure of implementation and this will bring a trusted deficit between developing and developed nations. And the next negative is the ambiguity on additionality that is lack of clarity on whether finance is new or additional. If there is a lack of clarity then this will lead to recycled funding rather than fresh funding. So uh, this will not bring a new or an another milestone step in the fight against the climate change. So we discussed uh, what are the benefits and the negative sides of uh, new quantified, new collective quantified goals. So now we will discuss what can be done to make it more effective. First one is setting clear and time bound targets. At present, the target is between five to ten years, but the new collective quantified goal has to fix a time bound target. Then only the implementation will be stronger. And the next is the boost adaptation funding. This is very essential to focus balance on both adaptation and mitigation rather than then only it will bring a balance or a long lasting result, especially for countries that are vulnerable to climate change. And the next uh, can be done is the simplifying fund access that is reducing the hurdles or procedures to access fund. So this will ensure timely accessibility for developing and underdeveloped uh, nations to climate funds. And the next is the expand the contributor base fairly. That is including capable high income countries while maintaining historical response, while maintaining historical responsibility of nation. And the next thing can be done is the emphasizing grant over loans. So this will helpful for the developing and underdeveloped nations and this will reduce their debt burden. And they, it will encourage them to make many steps against the current climate crisis. The next is strengthening accountability that, uh, that includes implementing strict monitoring to ensure commitments are met. And the next is encouraging global partnership. So 
in the morning itself and now also we discussed the the, the how the cooperation between the brazil uh, norway and germany you know brought an effective result in reducing the deforestation in amazon so such a global partnerships can be increased for making effective and long lasting research and this will be very supportive uh, for organizing cooperative funds and uh, implementing strong sustainable projects so in this topic we discuss what is new collective quantified goals its positive side its negative sides and what can be done to make it more effective so with this we will move to our next article and before that try to answer the main question as we discuss look at this newspaper article taken from the hindu india pakistan and modifying the indus waters treaty this article is talking about india's moves to serve formal notice to pakistan regarding the modification of indus waters treaty so let us discuss more about the indus waters treaty its provisions and its role in the present system so without much delay let's get into our article and before moving to the article there is an important main question the question is the interlinking of the rivers can provide viable solutions to multi dimensional interrelated problems of droughts floods and interrupted navigation critically examine this question was actually asked in upsc in 2020 so the entire question is about how the how the interlinking of the rivers will provide solutions for problems such as droughts floods and interrupted navigation so we will try to answer this question with our discussion so let's begin our discussion so what is indus waters treaty it is a it is an agreement signed between india and pakistan on september 1960 under the mediation of world bank and this indus water treaty serves as a cooperative framework for the usage and and management of indus river system what are the key provisions of the treaty the article 2 and 3 of the indus river treaty it grants exclusive rights over eastern rivers that is ravi bees and satluj to india and rights on western rivers to pakistan that is jhelum chenab and indus so here we have to note that pakistan don't have exclusive rights over the western rivers that is india can use the western rivers also but for domestic and non consumptive uses that is for uh, hydro power generation and all and this is mentioned in article 4 of the treaty and the only condition is india has to maintain a minimum flow in that river and the next is article 7 and this article permits both countries to cooperation to cooperate on joint engineering projects but unfortunately due to the uh, strained relation between india and pakistan this provision is uh, rarely utilized and the uh, article also provides for dispute resolution that is it established a permanent indus commission to resolve matters between india and pakistan related to distribution of indus waters and at the same time it can also utilize neutral experts or the mediation of international court of justice for arbitration in matters regarding the distribution of water in the indus river and we know that the treaty itself was signed under the mediation of world bank in 1960 now we are going to see the role of the indus river treaty first one is water allocation like i said western rivers the rights are went are to the pakistan they can utilize water from jhelum chenab and indus at the same time india has limited rights over the western rivers coming to the indian side we have control over the exclusive control over the eastern rivers that is ravi bees and satluj therefore pakistan receives approximately 80% of the total water while india receives only 20% of the total water from the indus river system and second is the permanent indus commission and this permanent indus commission has members from both nations which is formally established to maintain cooperation between the nations regarding the distribution of water maintain communication and also resolve disputes between two nations in the matter of distribution of the river water and uh, as per the agreement they must meet at least once a year to discuss the distribution of water in the indus river system and the next is dispute resolution mechanism we know that the indus river treaty established a permanent indus commission for routine questions regarding the implementation of the treaty and this also provides for the participation of neutral experts for unresolved issues regarding the distribution of water if the problem is still persisting then the parties that the india and pakistan can take the issue to the court of arbitration for resolution and the fourth factor is the inspection of the indian projects on the western rivers we know that india india can utilize the western rivers for domestic and uh, non consumptive purposes therefore india has projects in the western river but these projects are really controversial due to the strained relation with the pakistan now we are going to see certain projects like that the first one is pakal dal and lower kalnai both these hydro projects are located on river chenab and this is objected by pakistan 
and the second one is Kishan Ganga hydroelectric projects in Jammu and Kashmir and this is a runoff river projects and the Pakistan in 2013 claimed that this will reduce water flow into Pakistan so therefore this project is also facing objection from Pakistan and the next project is Ratil hydro project on the river Chenab and for this project also Pakistan raised the concerns now we are going to see the challenges and way forward regarding the India Pakistan and the issue of Indus water distribution currently the biggest uh, modification that we need in the treaty is to we have to make the treaty adapt to the changing climate change the changing climate and the population growth and to meet these two demands we need certain strategies first one is technical dispute resolution that is focusing on resolving technical disputes between the two countries within the treaty framework and the second is enhanced transparency and data sharing that includes real time sharing of data regarding the water flow water availability flood risk and all this will bring a trust between the two nations regarding the distribution of water and the next step can be a joint basin management and here the both countries has to participate in water conservation flood control and all so definitely this will ensure a collaboration between the two nations and reduce the regional vulnerabilities regarding regarding the sustainable utilization of the river water and the next is the political commitment and dialogue that is a strong political will is needed for sustainable management uh, of the river between the two nations and this can be achieved only if there is a good relation in india pakistan uh, bilateral relation in the upcoming days coming to the recent developments we know that the formal notice to modify the treaty that was uh, served by india on august 2024 and here India invoked article 12 of the treaty to address current water needs and security concerns. So what can be expected? And we are expecting an increasing cooperation between the two nations for hydropower projects. And the second is include environmental impact assessment as, uh, as a requirement for share water between two nations for different river projects. And the next is establish framework addressing water scarcity due to climate change. So only these steps can enhance the a sustainable water sharing and a sustainable management of in the indus basin between these two nations so definitely if the bilateral relations goes well in maybe in near future we can expect a resolution in the in the dispute regarding indus river distribution now we will move to our next article look at this newspaper article affecting mental physical health of australia to ban social media for children under 16 this article is talking about the recent Australian government's plan to ban social media for children under 16 without parental concern. So, the government found that the increasing use of social media is affecting the mental and physical health of the children. And the representative body for social media platforms called Move this move the 20th century response to 21st century challenges. So, without much delay, let's get into a discussion. But before moving into the discussion, we have an important mains practice question here the question is with the growing concerns over the mental and physical well-being of children several countries are implementing stringent regulations on social media access for minors critically analyze the implications of such policies on children's rights privacy and digital literacy so this article is talking about critically analyzing that is how the uh, the regulations on social media will have impact on uh, children's rights privacy and the digital literacy we know that a digital platform is also a platform for learning therefore it also raises questions at the same time about privacy so what we have to how we can consider or, or maintain a balance between three these aspects while framing and implementing a social media regulation policy so that's what this question is all about we will answer this question after the discussion so without much delay let's get into our discussion first we are going to see the impact of social media on mental health the excessive use of social media we know that it is usually linked to increasing rates of anxiety depression and body image issues that if a person has body image issues then it will lead to low self-esteem and uh, stress and this body image issues are usually happens due to the you know the social media projection uh, and uh, other issues such as cyber bullying this will bring the severe psychological problems especially to, to the teenagers and it can even sometimes leads to other antisocial behavior or suicidal attempts and the ministry of health and family welfare found that the rising youth mental issues are due to the excessive digital consumption therefore they are calling for a therefore the ministry is calling for a mental health intervention to resolve this matter 
and the second is the impact on the health physical health that is the excessive screen time is linked to poor vision lack of exercise and uh, sleep problems so we know that the, if we are exposed to the uh, screen uh, beyond a per, beyond a certain time then it will affect your eyesight and the over usage of the mobile phone especially in the urban area or the over usage of the system will lead to lack of time for exercising or other outdoor activities this will have a prolonged impact on uh, people's health due to obesity and other cardiovascular issues and the second is the, the blue rays from the screen will affect your brain therefore it will disrupt your sleep therefore it will lead to other issues such as cardiovascular issues increasing rate of obesity and other um, psychological issues are also linked to this such as anxiety and depression and the national commission for the protection of children's right are has identified that the the prolonged screen time can lead to eye strain and uh, increasing rate of obesity and the third impact will be cultural and the societal impact that includes social media promotes consumerism and unrealistic expectation we know that the we are you know we we have a bunch of when you open social media you can see a bunch of products from uh, from platforms such as amazon flipkart and all and if you are using other social media then also you will be seeing ads from this platform in in uh, on that platform such as, for example you will be seeing ads from amazon and flipkart on instagram so this will create a kind of tension in the consumers to purchase more and more products and this will bring unrealistic expectations for example uh, certain companies are using uh, this kind of unrealistic advertisements for the promotion of antidepressant medicines or you know fat losing medicines and all this will have a prolonged health impact as well as psychological impact on the people and the next uh, cultural impact will be so, uh, frequent use of the uh, social media will result in development of new language skills slangs and abbreviations so this will maybe in future this will bring a threat to certain languages which are used by minorities and the next impact will be on family and relationships that is excessive screen time reduces quality interaction between individuals in the family therefore it will affect the strong bonds in the family and which will eventually make the family weaker and we can also see there are you know the people who are working in uh, it sectors and all they are suffering from uh, psychological issues due to the increased uh, screen time and we can also see that this uh, work on uh, systems has significant impact in their relationships and family life and the next impact will be on cognitive development and uh, academy that is the in excessive use of social media can lead to decreased uh, attention this will bring uh, bring down the uh, grades of the students particularly in the school level and the next impact will be the constant information flow can overload memory and impact information processing in the children and this will also affect their academic performance we know that once you open the social media you will be seeing both unwanted and uh, distorted and also at the same time uh, factual information so it will be very difficult for the for common individuals to understand the difference between a distorted material and a real material for example if you are uh, receiving an information regarding you know an interesting fact and you are spreading it and you are you are using that for research or even some other academic purposes but that will not have a factual base so this kind of distorted information are filled in social media and it is very you know difficult for common people to segregate the distorted and the non distorted materials and information therefore the overloading of this kind of information will impact the information processing and this can also affect the quality of education at the same time this can also bring down the academic performance of the student now we are going to see certain government initiatives taken in india to protect ensure the cyber rights of children first one is information technology guidelines guidelines rules 2021 this provides provisions for age gating parental control over the use of social media grievance reporting for child safety and the second is the national cyber crime reporting portal this portal enables reporting cyber crimes against the children if they are facing cyber bullying or other cyber stalking such issues then we can report the crime through the portal and third we have the new education policy 2020 the new education policy 2020 promotes digital literacy and safe utilization of online online platforms and also creates awareness about the mental health and one more thing we have to add here that is the national cyber crime reporting portal it is developed by the ministry of home affairs i forgot to mention and the next provision we have the digital india the digital india campaigns 
it has also taken certain child safety initiatives such as child safety campaigns uh, you know uh, safe utilization of cyber spaces and cyber hygiene and and under this we also have certain initiatives such as cyber swachat kendra this institutions promotes safe as well as safe utilization of cyber platforms and uh, cyber hygiene for individuals to reduce risk while using internet and then we have the posco act amendment amendment 2012 this act addresses online child sexual abuse and also strengthens strict punishment and penalties for accused for crimes that are targeting children through online platforms so in this topic we discussed the impact of uh, social media platform on on different aspects of human life and how it is affecting the quality of life and then we discussed the certain provisions that in india we have to protect the online safety of children and now we are going to see what can be done to improve the cyber security and privacy the first step can be a child specific privacy policies for tech platforms and second is aligning with the global data protection standards such as general data protection regulation this will bring international standards standards and enhances the child the cyber security and privacy of children sorry and the third one is parental controls and awareness programs on regarding the online risk associated with the utilization of cyber platforms so this will improve the cyber security and privacy of children so in this topic we discussed how the cyber platforms are impacting the all aspects and quality of life of individuals then we discussed certain provisions regarding the protection of child safety in the cyber space then we discussed how can we improve through certain steps by our own so with this we are coming to the conclusion for this topic with this we are coming to the conclusion for today's newspaper analysis if you like the video hit the like button and give your feedbacks as comments and share this content with your friends and before leaving this channel don't forget to subscribe and also hit the bell icon to receive on time update thank you have a nice day take care of yourself